chapter two the infantile sexuality the precocious manifestations of sexual fantasy as cause of the shock now seem to be the source of neurosis this logically attributed to children of far more developed sexuality than had been hitherto admitted many cases of precocious sexuality had been recorded in literature long before the time of psychoanalysis for instance a girl of two years old with normal menstruation or cases of boys of three and four and five years of age having normal erections and so far ready for cohabitation these were however curiosities great astonishment was caused when freud began to attribute to the child not only ordinary sexuality but even polymorphic perverse sexuality all this based upon the most exhaustive investigation people inclined much too lightly to the superficial view that all this was merely suggested to the patients and was a highly disputable artificial product hence freud's three contributions to the sexual theory not only provoked opposition but even violent indignation it is surely unnecessary to insist upon the fact that science is not furthered by indignation and that arguments of moral resentment may perhaps please the moralist that is his business but not a scientific man for whom truth must be the guide and not moral indignation if matters are really as freud describes them all indignation is absurd if they are not so again indignation will avail nothing the conclusion as to what is the truth can only be arrived at on the field of observation and research and nowhere else the opponents of psychoanalysis with certain honorable exceptions display rather ludicrously a somewhat pitifully inadequate realization of the situation although the psychoanalytic school could unfortunately learn nothing from their critics as the criticism took no notice of its investigations and although it could not get any useful hints because the psychoanalytic method of investigation was and still is unknown to these critics it remains a serious duty for our school to explain thoroughly the contrast between the existing conceptions it is not our endeavor to put forward a paradoxical theory contradicting all existing theories but rather to introduce a certain category of new observations into science therefore we regard it as a duty to do whatever we can to promote agreement it is true we must renounce all hope of obtaining the approval of those who blindly oppose us but we do hope to come to an understanding with scientific men this will be my endeavor now in attempting to sketch the further intellectual development of the psychoanalytic conception so far as the so-called sexual theory of the neuroses is concerned objections to the sexual hypothesis as i said the finding of precocious sexual fantasies which seemed the source of the neurosis forced freud to the view of a highly developed sexuality in infancy as you know the reality of this observation has been contested by many who maintain that crude error that narrow-minded delusion misled freud and his whole school alike in europe and in america so that the freudians saw things that never existed they regarded them as people in the grip of an intellectual epidemic i have to admit that i possess no way of defending myself against criticism of this kind the only thing i can do is to refer to my own work asking thoughtful persons if they discover there any clear indications of madness moreover i must maintain that science has no right to start with the idea that certain facts do not exist at the most one can say this seems very improbable we want still more proofs and more research this is also our reply to the objection it is impossible to discover anything trustworthy by the psychoanalytic method as this method is practically absurd no one believed in galileo's telescope 
and Columbus discovered America on a false hypothesis. The psychoanalytic method may be full of errors, but this should not prevent its use. Many chronological and medical observations have been made with inadequate instruments. We must regard the objections to the method as pretexts until our opponents come to grip with the facts. It is there. A decision must be reached, not by wordy warfare. Our opponents also call hysteria a psychogenic disease. We believe that we have discovered the etiological determinants of this disease, and we present without fear the results of our investigation to open criticism. Whoever cannot accept our results should publish his own analyses of cases. So far as I know, that has never been done, at least not in European literature. Under the circumstances, critics have no right to deny our conclusions a priori. Our opponents have likewise cases of hysteria, and those cases are surely as psychogenic as our own. There is nothing to prevent their pointing out the psychological determinants. The method is not the real question. Our opponents content themselves with disputing and reviling our researches, but they do not point out any better way. Many other critics are more careful and more just, and do admit that we have made many valuable observations, and that the associations of ideas given by the psychoanalytic method will very probably stand, but they maintain that our point of view is wrong. The alleged sexual fantasies of childhood with which we are here chiefly concerned must not be taken, they say, as real sexual functions, being obviously something quite different, since at the approach of puberty the characteristic peculiarities of sexuality are acquired. This objection, being calmly and reasonably made, deserves to be taken seriously. Such objections must also have occurred to every one who has taken up analytic work, and there is reason enough for deep reflection. The Conception of Sexuality the first difficulty arises with the conception of sexuality. If we take sexuality as meaning the fully developed function, we must confine this phenomenon to maturity, and then, of course, we have no right to speak of sexuality in childhood. If we so limit our conception, then we are confronted again with new and much greater difficulties. The question arises, how then must we denominate all those correlated biological phenomena pertaining to the sexual functions sensu strictiori, as, for instance, pregnancy, childbirth, natural selection, protection of the offspring, etc. It seems to me that all this belongs to the conception of sexuality as well, although a very distinguished colleague did once say childbirth is not a sexual act. But if these things do pertain to this concept of sexuality, then there must also belong innumerable psychological phenomena. For we know that an incredible number of the pure psychological functions are connected with this sphere. I shall only mention the extraordinary importance of fantasy in the preparation for the sexual function. Thus we are arrived, rather, at a biological conception of sexuality, which includes both a series of psychological phenomena as well as a series of physiological functions. If we might be allowed to make use of an old but practical classification, we might identify sexuality with the so-called instinct of the preservation of the species, as opposed in some way to the instinct of self-preservation. Looking at sexuality from this point of view, we shall not be astonished to find that the root of the instinct of race preservation so extraordinarily important in nature, goes much deeper than the limited conception of sexuality would ever allow. Only the more or less grown-up cat actually catches mice, but the kitten plays at least as if it were catching mice. The young dog's playful indications of attempts at cohabitation begin long before puberty. We have a right to suppose that mankind is no exception to this rule, although we do not notice similar things on the surface in our well-brought-up children. 
investigation of the children of the lower classes proves that they are no exceptions to the biological rule it is of course infinitely more probable that this most important instinct that of the preservation of the race is already nascent in the earliest childhood than that it falls at one swoop from heaven full-fledged at the age of puberty the sexual organs also develop long before the slightest sign of their future function can be noticed where the psychoanalytic school speaks of sexuality this wider conception of its function must be linked to it and we do not mean simply that physical sensation and function generally designated by the term sexual it might be said that in order to avoid any misunderstanding on this point the term sexuality should not be given to these preparatory phenomena in childhood this demand is surely not justified since the anatomical nomenclature is taken from the fully developed system and special names are not generally given to more or less rudimentary formations after all the objections to the terminology do not spring so much from objective arguments as from those tendencies which lie at the base of moral indignation but then no objection can be made to the sex terminology of freud as he rightly gives to the whole sexual development the general name of sexuality but certain conclusions have been drawn which so far as i can see cannot be maintained the sexuality of the suckling when we examine how far back in childhood the first traces of sexuality reach we have to admit implicitly that sexuality already exists ab owo but only becomes manifest a long time after intrauterine life freud is inclined to see in the function of taking the mother's breast already a kind of sexuality freud was bitterly reproached for this view but it must be admitted that it is very ingenious if we follow his hypothesis that the instinct of the preservation of the race has existed separately from the instinct of self-preservation ab owo and has undergone a separate development this way of thinking is not however a biological one it is not possible to separate the two ways of manifestation of the hypothetical vital process and to credit each with a different order of development if we limit ourselves to judging by what we can actually observe we must reckon with the fact that everywhere in nature we see that the vital processes in an individual consist for a considerable space of time in the functions of nutrition and growth only we see this very clearly in many animals for instance in butterflies which as caterpillars pass an asexual existence of nutrition and growth to this stage of life we may allot both the intrauterine life and the extrauterine time of suckling in man this time is marked by the absence of all sexual function hence to speak of manifest sexuality in the suckling would be a contradictio in adjecto the most we can do is to ask if among the life functions of the suckling there are any that have not the character of nutrition or of growth and hence could be termed sexual freud points out the unmistakable emotion and satisfaction of the child while suckling and compares this process with that of the sexual act this similarity leads him to assume the sexual quality in the act of suckling this conclusion is only admissible if it can be proved that the tension of the need and its gratification by a release is a sexual process that the act of suckling has this emotional mechanism proves however just the contrary therefore we can only say this emotional mechanism is found both in nutrition and in the sexual function if freud by analogy deduces the sexual quality of sucking from this emotional mechanism then his biological empiricism would also justify the terminology qualifying the sexual act as a function of nutrition this is unjustifiably exceeding the bounds in either case it is evident that the act of sucking cannot be qualified as sexual we are aware however of functions in the suckling stage which have apparently nothing to do with the function of nutrition such as sucking the finger and its many variations this is perhaps the place to discuss whether these things belong to the sexual sphere these acts do not subserve nutrition but produce pleasure of that there is no doubt but nevertheless it is disputable whether this pleasure which comes by sucking should be called by 
analogy a sexual satisfaction it might be called equally pleasure by nutrition this latter qualification has even the further justification that the form and kind of pleasure belong entirely to the function of nutrition the hand which is used for sucking finds in this way preparation for future use in feeding one's self under these circumstances nobody will be inclined by a petitio principii to characterize the first manifestation of human life as sexual the statement which we make that the act of sucking is attended by a feeling of satisfaction leaves us in doubt whether the sucking does contain anything else but the character of nutrition we notice that the so-called bad habits shown by a child as it grows up are closely linked with early infantile sucking such for instance as putting the finger in the mouth biting the nails picking the nose ears etc we see too how closely these habits are connected with later masturbation by analogy the conclusion that these infantile habits are the first step to onanism or to actions similar to onanism are therefore of a well-marked sexual character cannot be denied it is perfectly justified i have seen many cases in which a correlation existed between these childish habits and later masturbation if this masturbation takes place in later childhood before puberty it is nothing but an infantile bad habit from the fact of the correlation between masturbation and the other childish bad habits we conclude that these habits have a sexual character in so far as they are used to obtain physical satisfaction from the child's own body this new standpoint is comprehensible and perhaps necessary it is only a few steps from this point of view to regarding the infant's act of sucking as of a sexual character as you know freud took the few steps but you have just heard me reject them we have come to a difficulty which is very hard to solve it would be relatively easy if we could accept two instincts side by side each an entity in itself then the act of sucking the breast would be both an action of nutrition and a sexual act this seems to be freud's conception we find in adults the two instincts separated yet existing side by side or rather we find that there are two manifestations in hunger and in the sexual instinct but at the sucking age we find only the function of nutrition rewarded by both pleasure and satisfaction its sexual character can only be argued by a petitio principii for the facts show that the act of sucking is the first to give pleasure not the sexual function obtaining pleasure is by no means identical with sexuality we deceive ourselves if we think that in the suckling both instincts exist side by side for then we project into the psyche of the child the facts taken from the psychology of adults the existence of the two instincts side by side does not occur in suckling for one of these instincts has no existence as yet or if existing is quite rudimentary if we are to regard the striving for pleasure as something sexual we might as well say paradoxically that hunger is a sexual striving for this instinct seeks pleasure by satisfaction if this were true we should have to give our opponents permission to apply the terminology of hunger to sexuality it would facilitate matters were it possible to maintain that both instincts existed side by side but it contradicts the observed facts and would lead to untenable consequences before i try to resolve this opposition i must first say something more about freud's sexual theory and its transformations the polymorphic perverse sexuality of infancy we have already reached the conclusion setting out from the idea of the shock being apparently due to sexual fantasies that the child must have in contradiction to the views hitherto prevailing a nearly fully formed sexuality and even a polymorphic perverse sexuality its sexuality does not seem concentrated on the genital functions or on the other sex but is occupied with its own body whence it is said to be autoerotic if its sexual instinct is directed to another person no distinction or but the very slightest is made as to sex 
It can, therefore, be very easily homosexual. In place of non-existing local sexual function, there exists a series of so-called bad habits which from this standpoint look like a series of perversities since they have the closest analogy with the later perversities in consequence of this way of regarding the subject sexuality whose nature is ordinarily regarded as a unit becomes decomposed into a multiplicity of isolated striving forces freud then arrived at the conception of the so-called erogenous zones by which he understood mouth skin anus etc it is of course a universal tacit presumption that sexuality has its origin in the sexual organs the term erogenous zone reminds us of spasmogenic zones and the underlying image is at all events the same just as the spasmogenic zone is the place whence the spasm arises so the erogenous zone is the place whence arises an affluent to sexuality based upon the model of the genital organs as the anatomical origin of sexuality the erogenous zones must be conceived as being so many genitals out of which the streams of sexuality flow together this is the condition of the polymorphic perverse sexuality of childhood the expression perverse seems to be justified by the close analogy with the later perversities which present so to speak but a new edition of certain early infantile perverse habits they are very often connected with one or other of the different erogenous zones and are the cause of those exchanges in sex which are so characteristic for childhood according to this view the later normal and monomorphic sexuality is built up out of several components the first division is into homo and heterosexual components to which is linked an autoerotic component as also there are components of the different erogenous zones this conception can be compared with the position of physics before robert mayer when only isolated forces having elementary qualities were recognized whose interchanges were little understood the law of the conservation of energy brought order into the interrelationship of the forces at the same time abolishing the conception of those forces as absolute elements but regarding them as interchangeable manifestations of one and the same energy the sexual components as energic manifestations conceptions of great importance do not arise only in one brain but are floating in the air and dip here and there appearing even under other forms and in other regions where it is often very difficult to recognize the common fundamental idea thus it happened with the splitting up of sexuality into the polymorphic perverse sexuality of childhood experience forces us to accept a constant exchange of isolated components as we notice more and more that for instance perversities exist at the expense of normal sexuality or that the increase of certain kinds of sex manifestations causes corresponding deficiencies of another kind to make the matter clearer let me give you an instance a young man had a homosexual phase lasting for some years during which time women had no interest for him this abnormal condition changed gradually toward his twentieth year and his erotic interest became more and more normal he began to take great interest in girls and soon the last traces of his homosexuality were conquered this condition lasted several years and he had some successful love affairs then he wished to get married he had here to suffer a great disappointment as the girl to whom he proposed refused him during the ensuing phase he absolutely abandoned the idea of marriage after that he experienced a dislike of all women and one day he discovered that he was again perfectly homosexual that is young men had an unusually irritating influence upon him to regard sexuality as composed of a fixed heterosexual component and a like homosexual element will never suffice to explain this case for the conception of the existence of fixed components excludes any kind of transformation to understand the case we have to admit a great mobility of the sexual components which even goes so far that one of the components can practically disappear completely whilst the other comes to the front if only substitution took place if for instance the homosexual component entered the unconscious leaving the field of consciousness to the heterosexual component modern scientific knowledge would lead us to conclude 
that equivalent effects arose from the unconscious fear those effects would have to be conceived as resistances against the activity of the heterosexual component as a repugnance towards women experience tells us nothing about this there have been some small traces of influences of this kind but of such slight intensity that they cannot be compared with the intensity of the former homosexual component on the conception that has been outlined it is also incomprehensible how this homosexual component regarded as so firmly fixed can never disappear without leaving active traces to explain things the process of development is called in forgetting that this is only a word and explains nothing you see therefore the urgent necessity of an adequate explanation of such a change of scene for this we must have a dynamic hypothesis such commutations are only conceivable as dynamic or energic processes i cannot conceive how manifestations of functions can disappear if i do not accept a change in the relation of one force to another freud's theory did have regard to this necessity in the conception of components the presumption of isolated functions existing side by side began to be somewhat weakened more in practice than theoretically it was replaced by an energic conception the term chosen for this conception is libido